have, instead of what was originally planned, which was a breakout session, we're going to have sort of a hybrid. So uh, a panel to get us started with some ideas about MNT and policy design. Uh, and then we'll open it up for a question and conversation with, uh, with everybody in the room. So without any further ado, we'll start with Rowan's presentation. Rowan Gray. Hi, nice to see you all again. It's been a long time. Um, so I'll try, I want to try and get through a fair bit of storytelling, so I'm going to try and keep the analysis short and we can talk about it afterwards. Um, I've had the opportunity over the last couple of years to be involved in a number of different uh, legislative and, and quite intensive policy design uh, opportunities. Uh, various other sort of things around the edges. I get asked to comment on a lot of bills, a lot of regulations, speak to a lot of different people uh, uh, on things as they come up. Um, but these are some that I got to work on pretty pretty closely, take the lead on or take the co-lead on on some of them. Uh, and I, I use that old line, never let a go crisis go to waste, as an example of how if you're sort of informed by a good NMT's perspective and have the right toolkit or working with the right people, uh, that you can lean into those moments, even at a time when nothing is realistically going to get passed by the US Congress, um, that you can still use the policy design process as another place to contest, another place to build political power, build consciousness. Um, so the first crisis is COVID. This is the way the story starts. I worked with Rashida Tlaib and Pramila Jayapal's office, Pr Pramila Jayapal being the head of the Congressional Progressive Caucus, Rashida Tlaib being one of the most progressive uh, people in Congress. And the goal with this was to provide emergency cash relief to every person uh, during the crisis for $2,000 a month, uh, and then a bit more afterwards. Uh, there are a number of bills that came out proposing similar things, and those who live in the United States will remember that you got a, a, a $2,000 check that somehow looked like a $1,200 check, but it was definitely $2,000. Uh, and then you got some other money at a different point as well. Um, but we were one of the first to put this out, and days after we put ours out, Bernie and, and Kamala Harris and others put out a, a similar similar number. So even though nobody was ever going to give Rashida Tlaib credit for this, uh, they set a tone that others then had to try to meet, uh, plus some um, watering down. But we smuggled into this bill, the idea of giving everybody cash was a really great moment to make a case about how money works. Because when you're offering everybody money, they're quite receptive to how it gets created. Uh, and one of the challenges we saw in 2008 that was fresh enough in most people's minds was that shortly after you do a big spending bill, as we're seeing now, uh, the concerns about uh, austerity and inflation come roaring back like they did in 2010 and 11. So rather than having another fiscal commission and budget deficit debt all this kind of stuff coming flying back we wanted to preempt that conversation so we said instead of funding this the normal way we're going to use that trillion dollar coin idea from 10 years ago that was originally proposed to deal with the debt ceiling and we're going to print the coins and give it to you do you have a problem with that <laughs> Surprisingly, not many people did. Uh, and so even though it was a bill, it was, it was written in quite detailed language, uh, we used a hashtag, we, we lent into the meme, we made public websites, we did you know, the press junket kit, and it was extremely powerful, it was extremely effective. People were talking about it on the street, people were talking about it in the news, newspapers, New York Times, etc. Um, and part of the goal here was I wanted to push the MMT agenda. This was a good opportunity to do it. I don't believe in universal basic income, but I do believe in cash support when it's appropriate. And this was an extremely appropriate moment. Uh, but as we started to design the bill, one of the Rashida Tlaib's commitments, of course, was making sure everybody actually got it. Everybody meaning everybody. Undocumented people, homeless people, people who don't have a bank account, people who didn't file a tax ref uh, return. And so we started thinking, how would you actually do that? Bank accounts won't work. IRS data won't work. You want something that people might actually trust, that is to say a card that's not connected to any strings and any back doors and all that kind of stuff that's not going to have a bunch of interchange fees that you could go and give to anybody. And there is that technology. They use prepaid cards, although they're badly designed now. So we said, we'll do it better. We'll take out the, ch the fees. We'll make it user accessible. And one day, we'll actually make one of those cards where there isn't even an intermediary private bank providing the cards. We'll make an actual digital cash card. But of course, it's not all good enough to say 
come to your local postal service and you can pick it up when a lot of people are struggling. A lot of people are home disabled. They're afraid of COVID. They're houseless and not necessarily able to get themselves places if they can't get public transportation. So we had to create an emergency responder core proposal that polled at over 75% across both political parties. And the idea was that you would do something like the US Census and literally come to people's doors in emergency communities and perform a wellness check and hand the card over and make sure they knew how to use it. So in the act of just doing something very simple, like an automatic fiscal stabilizer, we had to deal with questions of access, questions of symbolism, questions of messaging, memeing, the policy design process revealed a whole set of problems that we wouldn't have even started considering unless we looked at it from this level of granularity. We also worked with some local elected officials. It started with some members of the Democratic Socialists of America in Chicago on the uh, city council. And they were saying, what can we do at the state and local level? We can't print money. And I said, the first thing you can do is ask the federal government to get some to you and give it to you. So fiscal sharing, second of all, the Fed created an emergency lending facility for state and local governments for the first time ever after refusing to do so in 2008. But it was designed as some weak source designed to fail. So we said you should do that better and properly. And then we also said in the future, recognizing Christine Dezan's point that even state and local uh, lending and banking based frameworks have problems, we should look at ways of designing state and local complementary currencies and having those supported directly by the Fed through this newly established swap line arrangement system they use for supporting foreign currencies. If you can provide a swap line from the Fed to the ECB, you can provide a swap line from the Fed to the state of Illinois. We had over 100 elected officials on this, got a fair bit of press, and again introduced the MMT ideas of Mint the Coin and Rashida Tlaib's bill being a great example of something they were supporting at the same time. And again, wasn't going to pass anytime soon, but allowed a whole generation of state and local elected officials to realize that when these moments come, the person they should be pointing to is the person with the money power, and these are the kinds of arguments they should be making proposals they should be doing. Second big craze, as you probably are sick of hearing from every one of your crypto bro friends, right? Financial technology is going to change the world. You're going to make a huge amount of money. Trust us. We're going to solve some really big problems, but if we don't, oh well, we'll still make money anyway. And one of the big areas in this, uh, whatever you think about all of the private cryptocurrencies, um, the story of stable coins, that is to say digital coins whose value is supposed to remain relatively fixed at the value of the US dollar or something else, uh, in my view, in the view of other banking scholars, is essentially a uh, unregulated bank deposit. This is shadow banking again. We've seen this story before with money market funds. We've seen this story before with e-money, PayPal, money transmitters. And we've seen it before with wildcat banks and things like that. So we said the problem here is in fact that the banking regulatory regime has had a long-standing hole in how it defines deposits. This has been well written about by colleagues of ours, widely respected. It's, it's a generally accepted problem amongst depository law experts. So we are going to fix that loophole once and for all. We're going to use the negative energy around crypto and we're going to try to preemptorily address this new mania on the way up in the way that people like Minsky suggested. And this was extremely uh, uh, poorly received by the crypto community precisely because they knew it was very devastating to their framework. It's very easy to say that Bitcoin and Ethereum and things like that are outside the state and doing something revolutionary. It's a lot harder to say you're doing something truly revolutionary when what you're doing is issuing something that walks and talks like a US dollar bill. Uh, this was seen as extreme and radical at the time, even though Stephen Lynch, who was a well-known Democratic moderate, who happened to chair the FinTech task force in the House Financial Services Committee, so no marginalized figure in Congress by any stretch, uh, was the co-sponsor uh, of this bill. Uh, and uh, a year later, the recommendations in this bill uh, were largely adopted, not entirely, but largely around the, the idea that there should be a banking license by the President's Working Group group report on stable coins and is now the Treasury's position, although there are other forces trying to weaken that regulatory regime back to the, era, to the framework they would have preferred to have uh, if we didn't insist this was the better way of doing it. 
Uh, we also proposed independently and somewhat before the crypto craze, but I'm putting it together because I think they make a nice pair, a public banking act which would not establish a federal public bank because for the reasons that Christine was mentioning, I don't think we need to be doing through credit and lending models what we could be doing through spending and taxing models at the federal level. But state and local governments don't have that power and there are still some pretty tricky logistical and design issues to work out around a, a, a genuine system of nested complementary currencies, which is how you might actually have monetary pluralism at the sub-federal level connected to a federal system. So we said, let's have the federal government provide a regulatory regime that would recognize and support state and local governments to create state and local public banks. We'll provide an incubator program, we'll provide grants, we'll provide support from the Fed. We'll give them special interest earning accounts. So if you store money on behalf of a state or city government, you don't actually have to worry about investing in the stock market or investing in some risky security because we'll give you a great return above the market rate where you can just park that money there. Uh, and we made sure that all of those grants and incubators were financed by a special purpose account at the Fed so that it didn't show up in the budget numbers, couldn't be accused of adding to the deficit. Again, some nice accounting gimmickry to get around some dumb accounting gimmickry critiques. Uh, the third crisis, somewhat related, is the crisis of central bank digital currencies. Uh, after Facebook tried to create its stablecoin, Libra, the artist formerly known as Libra, now DM, now deceased. Um, the, the central bankers finally realized that the one thing they hate more than providing public goods directly uh, is losing power over the banking system to big tech. So they decided they were going to create, uh, finally need to create a, their own CBDCs, a few countries that were more foresighted had already been ahead of the curve on this. But uh, I had started working on this about three or four years before that, working with the International Telecommunications Union at the United Nations to develop technical standards around how central bankers should design these. This was very neutral. This was very uh, standards-based. This was simply trying to set out the debate with clear terms so that wherever policymakers fell, we had a language to describe that. Uh, and then I had the opportunity to work uh, with, again, Stephen Lynch's office to develop a bill to say, look, it is good to have public digital money. Bank accounts do not cut it, uh, but we don't need to replicate uh, bank accounts alone. We need to actually have a form of digital currency that works like cash. Doesn't keep a record, doesn't keep a ledger. You can store it in your pocket. It works offline, works on a card or a phone, and it protects your privacy and anonymity so you can avoid Big Brother uh, while also still believing in public goods. And we're in the middle of pushing this idea in Congress still, uh, but it was covered by all the major press, all the major tech press, all the major crypto press. Uh, a number of stakeholders across the spectrum loved it. The ACLU and other privacy groups who had stayed on the sidelines on monetary issues for 15 years have got in there in the fray and right into the Fed now. Uh, various racial justice groups and others are in on this and we're starting to work with technologists to actually build proof of concept because the biggest challenge at the moment is imaginative. People go, is that even possible? <laughs> it is possible, but you have to show, not tell. Uh, and lastly, the big crisis of inflation. Again, we've been working on some of this before inflation hit. Uh, Ayanna Presley's office wanted to propose a job guarantee in the tradition of the civil rights movement and the tradition of Coretta Scott King and Sadie Alexander and black women leading the charge for a job guarantee in the United States. We developed this initially as a resolution that was an intended to become a full bill. Uh, the resolution is, I still think, probably the most progressive and detailed articulation of a design proposal for a job guarantee, uh, including a worker bill of rights, workforce development, unionization, pay scale commitments, things like that. Uh, but in the process of trying to design the full bill, it became apparent just how many questions uh, and thorny details need to be seriously addressed before we can seriously suggest it be introduced into Congress. And that process is still ongoing. It's a little bit harder when the Biden administration says in no uncertain terms they don't care about the job guarantee. But uh, what has been humbling in this process even more than some of the others is just how big the challenge of doing this design right is uh, once you get close to the details. Uh, and then lastly, uh, dealing with inflation, not through trying to preempt 
the Nauru unemployment uh, trade-off that we're seeing back in the public debate now, but to look at ways that we could keep interest rates at zero while still regulating private investment through credit regulation, reviving a long tradition of using credit regulation around the world, uh, including other tools like required savings, uh, liquidity and leverage limits on uh, regular firms, and uh, reforming both the uh, Congressional Budget Office and establishing an interagency uh, organization to manage price regulation. Uh, this report came out at a time when a lot of people were talking about MMT as only caring about uh, uh, fiscal adjustment. So if you can't change interest rates, your only other tool is to keep fiscal policy adjusting to deal with demand. And our point was to show that there are in fact many different tools to skin, many different inflationary cats, uh, and that this crude binary is simply the neoclassical orthodoxy trying to pigeonhole MMT and the the tools available to us into the binary they have and simply flip it upside down. So I'll stop there, happy to talk about any of those experiences, but hopefully you can get a sense of the kind of policy work we're doing, the kinds of questions we're asking and trying to address, and the ways in which we're working with actual policy makers on this, even in conditions where it's extremely difficult to get any legislation passed and still moving the needle uh, in important ways. Thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. This marks the end of the MMT Summer School. MMT, uh, Rowan Gray has left the building. <laughs> okay, so my ple it's my pleasure to invite to the podium for the second time today, John Harvey, AKA the Cowboy Economist. <laughs> I thought I was going third. All right. Well, first of all, I think you'll all be very pleased to hear that I'm going to follow a famous dictum right now, and that is that there's no such thing as a speech that is too short. And the reason for that is that <clears throat> I'm not really an MMT policy person. I mean, when I, you know, teach an intermediate macro, when I get around to policy, I block copy things from Pavlina and from Stephanie and from Fidel, and I tell the students all about it. So it's not an area that I am... Um, of an area of scholarship for me. Uh, my area is more exchange rates. And so I was mentioning this as we were setting this up to Randy, and he said, well, why don't you talk about interest rates then? I said, okay, I can do that. All right, so, and the idea that in the MMT job guarantee world, we might be uh, keeping interest rates low. And this is actually a little bit um, in opposition to what I had said earlier. Because earlier I had said, okay, well, if we have this um, uh, MMT job guarantee world that, that the, the worry about this collapse of the currency is, is not something to be worried about, well, the way, and, and here's the other problem. You guys asked excellent questions. And so a great deal of what I was going to talk about right now, I, I've already said, but the gentleman in the back there is asking about, you know, well, but won't monetary policy still matter uh, going through the you know, uh, capital markets uh, mechanism? And yes, I mean, as I mentioned here, you know, just a few hours ago, uh, you know, why did, how did they hold the ruble up? Well, they doubled the interest rate. So what if an MMT run, you know, inspired economy is maintaining very low interest rates? Well, that's likely to keep the, you know, value of the currency low, which, I mean, you know, do you want a strong or weak currency? That, that's, a, uh, that's a question of whether or not you're thinking about the currency as being a cause of subsequent events or the result of things that, that led up to that. Um, you'd like to think you'd have a strong currency because people like your country, and so as the result of policies, a strong currency is good, but as a you know, cause, especially for a developed economy, um, you'd rather have kind of a weak currency because you can export easier. But, but at any rate, <clears throat> the whole idea that, um, you know, well, an MMT policy would probably cause you know exchange rates to be stronger because you have low unemployment and so forth well the interest rate is a really important variable in all that all right so um, maybe John Harvey's not right that pardon me <coughs> that it's not the purchasing power parity line <coughs> it's not the purchasing power parity line that's causing the the currency to be weaker but it could be the interest rate one so what do you do about that I mean uh, to some extent, you could just say, well, screw it, we'll ignore it, but that's easy for us in the United States. We don't have to worry about that so much. But, uh, and as I said earlier, uh, the answer is capital controls. I mean, do we need to have, uh, what was it, 98 point, I can't remember now, 9%, uh, uh, bless you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, 12 years of Catholic school. Um, and uh, do we need to have 98% you know, of, of these transactions that are taking place in the currency market that are just related to financial capital flows? Well, no, we don't. Now, how we actually make this you know, come down realistically, and this is really the topic here of the panel, so I, I 
can't speak to how, I and mean, we need Rowan to tell me, how do we, how do we make this happen, um, short of revolution? Um, because those who are gaining from that are not going to be in favor of, you know, well, gosh, the free market, uh, we need to be able to, you know, pull our money out of Mexico if Mexico doesn't seem like it's a good investment and put it in, you know, Peru or whatever. Um, so I mentioned briefly a minute ago, and this is what I wanted to talk about now, uh, are some policy ideas uh, from Eileen Grable. And again, I'm sorry that I already talked about this, but you guys asked really good questions. Um, <clears throat> and that is, you know, in trying to lower the, the, the you know, quantity of currency that is being just directed towards financial capital flows, uh, especially if you're not the United States and, and you're, you know, uh, Venezuela, um, then what can you do? Well, you know, we have this, the, the, the tripwires, as I mentioned earlier, I said one tripwire is a, um, the ratio of borrowing in foreign currency to domestic currency. As that goes up, before the Mexican financial crisis, before the Asian financial crisis, both of these things went up in these countries because it meant that they were becoming more and more susceptible to a currency depreciation. And, you know, short term versus long term, there's a number of things we can calculate uh, to, to, you know, look at these as, as again, as tripwires, and then things that act as speed bumps to sort of slow down the, the outward capital flow. But I think that, that you know, Eileen Grable, the big example she always uses is Venezuela, where they had, you know, much stricter, you know, if you're going to invest in Venezuela, then you have to have, uh, this is no longer true, but um, you have to have a compensating uh, balance at the central bank that earns no interest. Um, we have, you know, penalties for early withdrawal. Uh, and it's a difficult, well, everything about being a develop, developing country is a difficult road to, to, to you know, follow, but um, does that reduce the amount of capital flows to Venezuela? Sure. But it also reduces the, you know, the, the possibility they can suddenly leave. And <clears throat> I wrote a very primitive paper some time ago uh, on the impact of the Mexican financial crisis on all of the other, you know, Latin American countries. And Venezuela was the one where it was the least affected. Now, I don't have, I, I can't argue that it was specifically because of these policies, because uh, I didn't have a, a, any way to look at that transmission mechanism. But nevertheless, um, it, it seemed to work, all right? Uh, and so, what do we need to do to, you know, make this to where, because we're also so susceptible, as, as is happening right now, there's inflation, right? Oh, well, it's MMT's fault. Well, no, it's not. I mean, but, but when these things happen, we're going to get blamed. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and so, you know, if, if the currency were to depreciate because the interest rates are low, oh, my God, it's all MMT's fault. But that's not going to happen if capital flows aren't the primary determinant of exchange rates. Uh, and, and so if we can get it to where what is driven, you know, what's driving exchange rates is, in fact, the, um, I hate to use this neoclassical term, but the real economy, uh, then that's something that, that, you know, would not become a problem. And, uh, yeah, that's all I got. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, this panel is sort of representative of the, uh, the blend that we have between the economics MMT community and the legal uh, uh, tradition, legal scholarship. So John uh, Haskell will be our next speaker and will represent that wing of the, uh, the family. John. Hi, I'll be brief. Um, to get to this, I think the idea that uh, Fidel had told me was that this was originally in the spirit of a breakout session. So I sort of want to end my comments with a question to, to you, gang, and also just to the cohort more generally, maybe. I don't know. I, I defer to you. Anyway, okay, so here's my idea. My question is like, what are non intuitive alignments that we could think of to advance a progressive New Deal development state? agenda. And I want to talk to you a little bit about a personal story of why I got entangled in crypto blockchain and where I am right now. And I mean this in a way of like trying to be really honest and practice a spirit of democratic social, ah, you know, and get at something real to the underlying traumas and the experience of trying to feel this out and what it means to be moral you know what I mean? And not give that away, but also take, you know, self-preservation and all these really difficult questions that are so baked into how we think about social coordination 
and a healthy organization and healthy interpersonal relationships and all those informal nurturing aspects of an environment that actually make up a movement, right? Because if we can't be happy with each other, then what? And there's so many ways for good people of goodwill to run into tensions and it's so hard to like, you know, get a handle on that. So I, I don't know how, it, it sounds suddenly too therapeutic or something, but it's in that interpersonal organizational way that I kind of come at it. I, I like watching videos of Carl Rogers, of how he listens. I like reading family systems therapy for thinking about how organizations operate. Stuff like that, you know? And, and in that, so my idea was, well, in improv, they say you always have to accept what gets put on the table, right? So if someone has a banana and they say it's a gun, you go, ah. But you have to accept it. You can't be like, that's not a gun. That's a, you know? <laughs> so, uh, is, right? You have to accept it for what it is and do something with it. Herbie Hancock said that he was playing and he hit a wrong note and Miles Davis just went with it and did something else and Herbie Hancock was shaking and he came up afterwards to apologize and Miles was like, no, that, that was cool. And he, and he realized that Miles was in so command that it was the fun of getting to flex in any adaptation that there's no wrong note. Right, so in that spirit, trying to come at this. Okay, so that means taking the community for who it is. Trying to understand the context, not writing at it, but being a friend who could be of service to a community and slowly develop working relationships of trust and thinking very clearly about one's moral bright line rules while staying open to learning, right? Really tough. So you start feeling that out, and certain things just aren't too cool. Like anyone who has like laser eyes, mm, right? Bitcoin, eh, you know, just like it's too difficult, right? A lot of a lot of the scenes have just like people you don't want to really associate with, <laughs> right? In the broader picture, right? And, and so, uh, so if you really care about the community you're cultivating, uh, then you're very careful about the sort of entanglements you get into, while understanding it's still a dark forest. And, uh, and so when you start thinking that out, uh, we start developing sort of rules and, and ways of trying to talk. So my idea was to be of service and try to slowly develop a certain set of principles or ideas, a culture that we could collaborate in new ways. And specifically, I've been working for years now in the sort of broader Ethereum space and trying to get into a relationship with more key architects within that broader ecology, those production lines which is really not about DeFi or money. I think it's actually about, you know, it's one of the largest, I want to be careful what I say here, like, you know, I don't want to oversell, I'm not trying to hype something right here. I think it's one of the most important social movements in recent memory since like the environmental movement. It's like captured the imagination in the way in that when you say it, it has like purchase in different social engagement contexts. It lets you get into certain rooms that you otherwise just don't necessarily have access to where it becomes a wrapper to do other things, potentially. It has a lot of the development and tech expertise drawing out of Silicon Valley and coming out of that and in this space and building out what really isn't, uh, I think, DeFi, but is about building out a giant social global uh, securities coordination architecture. Right? And the fight is over what that's going to look like in design. Is it going to have privacy built into it? Is there going to be responsible governance built into that? Are the politics going to be openly laid out on the table for democratic you know, deliberation? What does that look like in terms of institutional capacity? Right? Are we really doing it? Or are we, you know, is it just the typical Western talk right? towards the rest of the, you know, all those sort of questions? Okay, so. So trying to come with that spirit to it, I hope I'm, is this okay, this conversation? Like I'm, I, don't, I don't talk about this at all. It's only because of Fadel and Rohan, who I love dearly, and like, you know, my respect for, you know, admiration for Stephanie, you know, not that it matters who I am, right, or something. But like, I'm just sharing something that I wouldn't share, so I'm just trying to feel it out with you to try to think together, like, so you could help me maybe. And, you know, and uh, my idea was like, well, we got to get rid of the idea of decentralization and immutability, right? Like what a perverse idea that a contract is immutable forever, that property rights extend to the end of time, that prices will always be stable, right? That's like being a vampire. That's about like not being of one's time or place, 
of not being attached to one's mother, right, of the earth, right? It's a, the matrix means womb. It's a story of men who desperately don't want women for the reproduction of society, right, through a million different ways and through the legacies of uh, technology, right? Read David Noble's, like, amazing, like, radical feminist work. And, you know, you could look to, uh, you know, Feynman and Martha McCluskey's work on vulnerability, et cetera, right? Okay, so, so try, you know, trying to break down those ideas, showing them contracts obviously aren't immutable. Critical re legal studies and stuff is really good at sort of like making that go away. Or showing them there's no such thing as decentralized or centralized. It's a weird heuristic, right? You can always re-describe something as centralized or decentralized. Is the state centralized? You, you know, I don't know, right? Probably not. It's more like distributed. Right? It's like distributed governance. Like that's what blockchain taught me. Right? Layers and layers of distributed governance with all sorts of securities. Everything's a security, everything's coercion. Tricky. Okay, so getting that through. But the other side of it is, is that they are very anti-authoritarian. And that's kind of cool. And in so, there's a healthy strand of that anti-authoritarianism in there, which is what preserves it from just going into Wall Street or which just doesn't let it just go into those traditional channels, which actually gives the opportunity maybe for partnerships where you could imagine, I mean, Rohan's work, man, is absolutely incredible. Imagine the hardware, software, privacy respecting stack, right, through the law firms and the banks, through the industry, out to the public, where you could really communicate without surveillance. How innocent till proven guilty. Right? And imagine baking that into the infrastructure cake of the digital distributed technology ledger kind of stuff. And Rohan's stuff, like imagine like crypto wanting to suddenly fund, you know, a privacy respecting center institute or initiative somewhere, right? In order to like develop out these ideas, everyone wins. Now we still have d disagreements, right? But, but maybe or maybe not, that's a good idea. Maybe it's not a good idea, right? Maybe it, it legitimizes certain things we don't want to in a broader arrangement or tactical struggle. Maybe it compromises certain people too much. Maybe it's not no strings attached. Maybe it's not good faith. Maybe they aren't moral, right? Like maybe they don't understand that we really mean being moral, right? Uh, you know what I mean? And on the other hand, maybe there's st stuff for us to learn. Maybe like we could be a little less pure. We could think about that politics, you know, power is really hard and you know what I mean? Anyway, I'm not trying to be pretty. This is just what goes on in my head, like what I think about. And so what it's cool is right now, I'm going to wrap up with this, is that uh, I've been trying to think about how we go about that. So one is like, how would we go about getting, like, for example, key players in crypto and that resource production arrangement? What would be the right posture for them with governmental agencies such as the SEC? Is it just to provide information? Like, how, what would be a healthy first step towards uh, exploring regulatory integration and finding, you know, like mutual purpose? A second question would be, uh, where could they, where could there be investment that would feel prudent and responsible and not be overly a conflict of interest? Right? What sort of ask would we make on them, where we'd ask for their either technical resources or their money resources? You know, feel people out, see who they really are, right? That's what's so great about the job guarantee, right? It's like such a simple way to figure out where someone stands. If they equivocate, mm, you know what I mean? If it goes on gender, mm, you, you know what I mean? You kind of know where someone is in a room, right? It's an easy one. So, uh, and, and finally, uh, what would that look like in development policy? So right now, advising governments on blockchain law but which are really a development state program of how to integrate that to get funding for a Green New Deal in a way that's not just purely speculative. So we really need your expertise, I really mean this, in a multidisciplinary way of really brainstorming together about what sort of design that would look like so that we can do something that's responsible, you know what I mean? Or, or something like that. Okay, so thank you very much for letting me share with you. I appreciate your time. So, um,
Randy told me to uh, speak last and to cover everything that I didn't cover yet and everything that they didn't cover yet. So, uh, and to make sure that we leave on time for dinner. So it's, it's not going to happen. So the, the only thing I can do is to talk about two things. One is, uh, well, you hear it in a minute. It's a poem. Uh, it's a riddle for you to figure out. And two is the climate crisis and what an MMT informed policy design would, would look like. So we'll start with the riddle. And since all of you have uh, pen and pencils, as you hear the poem, start writing what you think is the answer. I know you're going to know it from the first line, but keep writing just in case. All right. And it's, I know it's not fair because some of you heard it before. So anyway, if you heard it, don't say anything. All right. It's a riddle for lawmakers. I'm the one the Fed wants to fight. They know not whence my appetite. I hide in plain sight, garnering a lot of spite. They taunt me in every speech, but I'm way out of their reach. And despite whatever they preach, don't they hear the deficit owl and its warning screech? They target me in vain every six weeks. They dig in their heels and never question their techniques. They call me names, persistent, transitory, stubborn. I'm unresponsive to their tweaks. They took away my food, my energy, so I showed them my core. If you want to tame me, you should invest a whole lot more. Your productive capacity is increasingly offshore. Your supply chains and logistics ought to be to die for. Your infrastructure is so poor, it's a sorry eyesore. Your minimum wage, multiply it by four. Your people are hurting while you debate the pay for. Give them education and health care or face the uproar. Spend on your children and elders and you won't see me sore. I feed on abusive market power and when I get really hyper, they measure me by the hour. Give me neglect, destruction, corruption and your purchasing power, I will devour. Trafficking and cartels greatly fuel my horsepower. I fear democracy, resilience, food sovereignty, and every locally produced green kilowatt hour. Tax and regulate the oligarchs, polluters, speculators. Listen not to gatekeepers and ivory towers. You don't need their money or their permission. It's both democracy and the planet they wish to deflower. You have the power of the purse, which I fear the most. It's your ultimate firepower. I inflict even more pain when you invite me in, especially when you import food, energy, and medicine. Don't blame me if your value added is merely, merely paper thin. And if your trade strategy is to take it on the chin. Trust me, as I rear my ugly head, trust me, I will ever win. In the 1970s, I grew out of OPEC, but little did they know, they thought that Volcker broke my back. But it was really Jimmy Carter who found the easy hack. He deregulated natural gas, which began the frenzy of the frack. It eased my grip, but a peace accord in the Mideast ultimately set me back. Listen to MMTers, ask questions, please don't be shy. Stephanie Kelton wrote the deficit myth. Read it, it will surely demystify. Appalachia has a blueprint. Let their people testify. Decarbonize the grid and transportation real fast before we die. Rebuild the foundations like it's a new 4th of July. With justice for workers, both blue collar and necktie, make it inclusive, not no excuses. It's not hard to diversify. Regenerative agriculture and climate jobs do I need to amplify. A dignified re-entry for people. I can almost hear them cry. End the opioid crisis, poverty, homelessness. Don't turn a blind eye. Repair the damage, clean the environment. Ask the, es the experts to testify, to purify, sorry. You're re we're already paying for it with blood, tears, and money, so don't tell me cash is hard to come by. 
The cost of doing nothing is already sky high. The cost of doing the right thing is so cheap, your inaction is really impossible to justify. If you can solve this riddle, you know you can't just stand by. Much work needs to be done. You can grow the size of the pie. I can still hide around the corner, but if you've learned your lesson, I will gladly wave goodbye. Who am I? Who am I? Inflation. Thank you. All right. So I'll say a few words and open it up to conversation uh, on climate change and what we can do in terms of what would a global Green New Deal look like? And this is sort of to complete my remarks from yesterday about the, the structural traps that we have in the global south. I'll start with one piece of information. Uh, a couple of years ago, the United Nations Environmental Program published a report called the Production Gap. Look it up, it's, it's ugly. Uh, in the sense that uh, the team looked at what the major fossil fuel companies and countries are planning to extract and burn by 2040 versus what we're actually allowed to extract and burn by 2040. Hence the gap, the production gap. And we're on track to produce and burn 140% more than what we're allowed to. So if there is any other big problem uh, in the world that can compete with this, uh, talk to me outside. So what are we going to do about it? We have to immediately stop building additional fossil fuel infrastructure. And number two, we have to have a, a rapid plan to phase out fossil fuels. Instead, what are we doing? Well, you know what we're doing. We're, if you look at the top 10 um, oil and gas companies in the last 10 years or so, every year they're adding capital expenditure at the tune of 600, 700, up to $900 billion a year of additional infrastructure that investors are expecting a certain rate of return over the next several decades. So we're not even close to moving in the right direction. So for the fossil fuel companies who are doing this, for the governments, the prime ministers, the commissions that are actually approving all of this additional capital expenditure, both in the global north and in the global south, they're doing one of two things. They're either signing our collective suicide pact or they're defrauding investors because they're building stranded assets. Because if we're serious about decarbonizing, then all of that infrastructure will become stranded, useless, meaning worth nothing from, from a financial perspective. So whether it's a collective suicide pact or financial fraud, it should be treated as a crime accordingly. So that's point number one. Point number two, how do we, if we get them to agree today, we're gonna restructure the world and you know, never let a good crisis go to waste, as, as Rowan said, what is our plan? What is our vision? What is an MMT informed way of restructuring the global uh, uh, international trade financial architecture, decarbonize the system rapidly and do it with a just transition uh, for, for workers in the fossil fuel industry and related industries for countries in the global south that rely heavily on exports of fossil fuels and, and so on. And that's where uh, I, I'd like to talk about a, a framework for reparations. And reparations in the uh, literature is three things. First, you tell the truth. So set up truth and reconciliation commissions if we have to, all over the world, to figure out where the damage is, who are the populations that were uh, hurt by uh, climate debt, uh, because the global south is not responsible for climate change, uh, you know, in terms of CO2 emissions from the Industrial Revolution forward, it's the Global North that's been responsible for that. Uh, number two, we talked yesterday about the colonial and neo-colonial traps, colonial and neo-colonial reparations. So reparations means, number one, telling the truth. Number two, moving forward actually with the reparations itself. And reparations doesn't necessarily mean simply monetary transfer, monetary compensation, although that's part of it. But we're talking about actually repairing broken structures. So how do you structurally repair the system? Reverse the flow of those $2 trillion I talked about yesterday that are moving in the wrong direction. And transfer real resources, technology, patents, so that you actually rebuild economies to be more resilient to face the challenge of climate change in the global south. So that, that means a, a whole 
new way of doing international trade, of doing quote unquote international development uh, from, from a global uh, north perspective. So if we're not changing the structures, if we're keeping the same international trade architecture, we're not gonna move very, very far. Um, and then finally, how do you set up uh, a, a different international trade financial architecture, not just for a one-time transfer, but for a, a continuous stabilizing financial architecture? Uh, Rowan earlier talked about complementary currencies at the local level in the United States, with the Fed providing swap lines to local states and municipalities to support those currencies. We do have swap lines between the Fed and a handful of other central banks globally, based on geopolitical interest. It's an exclusive privilege that countries have to, to have a swap line with the Fed. And we know it works because it's extremely stabilizing during the global financial crisis, during the, the COVID crisis, so we know it works. But why should we make that exclusive to only a handful of countries? And why should the Fed, the United States, the State Department, in other words, <laughs> be the agency to pick and choose which other economy we should support and, and stabilize. So uh, think of the SDR system, which is the, the, the IMF sort of reserve currencies, special drawing rights. Uh, it's been in the news lately and people are kind of thinking about it. Is, is this money, is this reserves, what, what is it? And, and where did it come from? All of a sudden $650 billion worth of SDR were issued into existence and we sort of don't know how, where it came from and where it's going and, and why just 650? Why only one time? Why not make it every year? Why not every six months? For what purpose? Can governments actually use that money? So the SDR, quote unquote, currency or reserves are issued by the five countries that create the, the basket that the IMF uses to create SDR, including the US and Euro and the UK and uh, uh, China and Japan and so on. So. It's an IOU, a joint IOU of those five countries, right? And it's issued to member nations according to their uh, participation or share in the IMF. So most of the issuance goes to the richest countries, uh, obviously, with the idea of, you know, some of the richest countries maybe will give their excess SDR to developing countries to help them buy COVID vaccines, for example which is kind of a, a silly way of paying for the vaccines because we heard that the Global North was given all the vaccines for free, but it turns out that the SDRs that were issued during the COVID crisis were just transferred into an account so that they can be transferred back to pay for the vaccines. So uh, pay attention to the SDR system and pay attention to it in a critical way because when we talk about law and economics in, in this community, we're talking about legal design. We're talking about systems and institutions that are created and designed to produce a particular public purpose. So can we think about a better legal design for this world currency, right? The SDR. Even some governments in the Global South asked their own central banks. We heard that the IMF gave you $500 million worth of SDR. We heard it's $500 million. We didn't hear the SDR part. So you have $500 million. Can we use it for fiscal spending during the crisis? And their independent central bank said, no, 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 it's not real money. It's just SDR. You're not allowed to touch it, right? Because we, the central bank, use it to do other things, to stabilize the exchange rate and, and so on. So why not? <laughs> it is real currency. So who is in charge of approving the uh, transaction from SDR into dollars or euros or British pounds. It's again, the process is controlled legally by the IMF. So if we're talking about by 2040, we're going towards the cliff and there is no future on the planet. I think this is the time to think big and think about redesigning the institutional structure, the legal and economic and international trade structure so that we can actually meet the challenge of climate change. We're not going to meet the challenge with the current system, for sure, with fossil fuels in place, with $2 trillion moving in the wrong direction every year, and with the level of fiscal restraint that both the Global South and the Global North is, is living with today. So MMT gives us kind of a macro framework to think about 
how much fiscal capacity each country can contribute to our efforts to transform the world economy. So we talk about the spectrum of monetary sovereignty. Not all countries have the same degree of monetary sovereignty. So you have countries like the US, Japan, Canada, Australia with a very high degree of monetary sovereignty. On the other end of the spectrum, you have countries that don't even have any monetary sovereignty. Countries that dollarize their economy, don't even have a national currency. So what determines where you sit on that spectrum is number one, your capacity to issue your own currency. Most countries can do that. Number two, your capacity to tax in your own currency. Most countries can do that. But it's three and four is where we lose the global south. Three, your capacity to issue debt denominated in your own currency and only in your own currency. In other words, you don't get into an external debt trap that I described yesterday. And number four, which is related to three, is your ability to avoid having to constantly defend the exchange rate or even fix your exchange rate to foreign currencies or to gold or something like that. So the more desperate you are to fix your exchange rate because of the external debt trap, the weaker your degree of monetary sovereignty. And as a result, the smaller fiscal policy space you have. So we have countries with plenty of fiscal policy space like the US, like Canada, like Australia, Japan, and so on. And they happen to be responsible for climate change. They happen to be countries that have uh, large productive capacity, large research and development capacity, large quantity of patents that will help us deal with climate change. And they happen to be morally, ethically responsible for colonial, neo-colonial, climate debt, you know, uh, uh, all kinds of you know, we can go into a longer list of, of issues that deserve reparations, including biopiracy by pharmaceutical companies, including uh, cultural heritage appropriation, scientific appropriation, and so on. So there's lots of grievances that fit into that category of, of reparations. But if we're going to do this, everybody has to contribute with what they can, either in kind or financial or technical assistance so that we redesign economies in the global south to be more resilient. So investing in food sovereignty, investing in renewable energy sovereignty, and not as loans with interest payments and debt traps, but as reparations, meaning grants and transfer of real resources. So who's stopping us from doing this? Two things, uh, the elites, the, the, the establishment, of the political and geopolitical system, but number two, the economics. That is the mainstream of the economics. As you, you're calling for hyperinflation. There's gonna be massive you know, spending, it's gonna cause massive deficits and massive national debts. It's unaffordable. All countries will go bankrupt. But if you have the MMT lens, you realize what is actually the limit of how much a country can spend. It's not tax revenues, it's not the borrowing capacity from the private sector. The limit to how much you spend is the risk of inflation. And we're obsessed with the risk of inflation. That's why I wrote the poem. So what determines the risk of inflation? Two things, the availability of productive capacity. The good news about productive capacity is that it's producible. So you can create millions of jobs. You can build more infrastructure, more resource, train more people. I mean, there are physical limits in terms of natural resources but that's manageable. That's where you invest in research and development, material science research, so that you have a different kind of output instead of this equipment going bad after three years. We wanna produce laptops and cell phones that actually last longer, right? And we wanna create a circular economy so that we truly have uh, a sustainable system. So lots of investment in research and development needs to go into the technology itself. But then you have a second component for the risk of inflation, which is abusive market power, both globally in terms of multinational corporations, but also domestically. So how do you go after abusive market power that drives a certain component of inflation? You don't go after abusive market power by spending less and say we can't afford to fight climate change. You go after abusive market power when you tax and regulate their abusive market power out of existence. So you democratize the system. Who's in charge of democratizing the system? It's the lawmakers who are responsible for upgrading the antitrust laws, for calling for investigations, congressional committees, 
the Cora style investigations. So these are the things that we need to put on the table for us in the community, in the MMT community. Be ready with the policy ideas, with the policy design. Be ready to call their bluff when they say we can't afford it. Be ready to call their bluff when they say it's going to be hyperinflation. Be ready to argue for practical solutions that are within reach. I mean, I'm, I'm not naive. I understand the politics and all of that. But I think our strength in the MMT community is to understand the real political obstacles and to name them and to work on the policy design, the economics, so that when we have the opportunity, if we have the opportunity, and we must have the opportunity for our own survival, 2040 is the day after tomorrow. So, thank you. So this is the time and space for questions, comments, to interact with, uh, with the panel. Uh, and I'll wait for hands up, and, and then I need to pass the, the mic, right? So I'll start with uh, Patricia. Thank you. Um, as you all know, a lot of what MMT has proposed is quite progressive, and um, progressive policy doesn't tend to be successful unless there is a strong enough pressure from the bottom up. And um, the non-progressives don't have that much of a problem because they tend to have more resources and they're smaller in number. So would you say that furthering democracy and increasing those channels for people at the bottom to express their will I is a fundamental part of implementing successful MMT policy? And if so, what would your recommendations be to achieve that? Yeah, can we gather like three questions at a time? And then, yeah. yeah, thank you. I think I'm, I'm just jumping on that question. And I think what I've struggled with since I am here at this conference is like all of you propose pretty progressive policies. I think most of in this room agree with that. Green New Deal, job guarantee to some degree. But it seems at the same time that MMT wants to keep a certain political neutrality by assuming that it's just describing things as it is. You know, I, I agree, we need to understand the financial system, et cetera, et cetera. We need to be understanding our critics. Um, but it's, you know, you can propose like an M MMT enforced an informed military dictatorship, whatever. Like, yeah, you're right. Like, is it, I'm just confused. Do you really think it's the right strategy to call it like an MMT, to have MMT as a bucket? Like I, I feel like there's a dis <laughs> like a divide. The, all the policies that you propose are are great, but and they need MMT as as an understanding, as a good theory. But shouldn't we have a Green New Deal conference and then have a couple of people talk about MMT rather than like talk about what is MMT policy? I don't think there's MMT policy. Right. Th there's good policies that can be MMT informed, but what is that policy? Thank you. I think one of the things that often gets missed is that we live in a competitive society that doesn't believe much in cooperation. And when you have a market, sports teams, and all of those kinds of things based on competition, it forms a kind of archetype in our brains. And then that informs a lens through which we look at the world. So I think one of the things that we need to do is to create a new archetype focusing on how many times we cooperate with one another and emphasizing that. So I wanted to take a look at that particular aspect of how we change the ways in which we believe things that are actually myths. And cooperation seems to me to be a bigger factor in our support of one another than cooperation is in terms of our growth and prosperity. Yeah, 
Yeah, so first of all, how to bring people into the process. I mean, this is critical. There's no point doing this unless you're working with people that are representing and, 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 and working with social movements and, and grassroots organizations. The, the politicians that I mentioned, with the exception of Stephen Lynch, who is uh, on the uh, House Financial Services Committee and represents a poor uh, working class neighborhood, the others are all coming from an activist background funded by social movements, not large donors. And uh, uh, we check in and bring into the process very early on a large number of stakeholder organizations groups to to get their input one of the things of course is to recognize that there's a difference between getting community input and assuming that every single thing that community might need is in that community there are people who are sick and dying of cancer in a community and don't know that there's a cancer drug that's been invented somewhere else and similarly there are people who know for example they don't like cops coming and and uh, uh, you know ice taking them out of their homes but they might not actually know that the fight over the design of digital cash is a really important part of that. And if you go to them and say, hey, have you thought about this? They'll go, oh crap, that makes a lot of sense. Like I rarely have to actually do much persuasion to say, I think this might be an issue that matters to you. And then they go, yes, it is. That's just me using my vantage point to help that community. But of course, then they say to me, this can't work or this needs to change. I go, all right, makes sense. And I go, I'm not sure about that. And we have that conversation. And there's a respect of the fact that the average person in a union might not want to write legislation, but if I write legislation they're not going to believe in, what am I doing? So I think it's really important to bring in those those groups, but I think there has to be a recognition that not everybody who has values and problems necessarily is doing the technical issue, like solution development, because some of those solutions actually require navigating complex institutions of which they're actually alienated from uh, for reasons not their fault at all. And the question of what the, the kind of boundary of MMT is, I, you know, I, we've had the conversation about descriptive and prescriptive enough between us that our respective views on that don't need to be rehashed here. But I think there's two things that are important to note there. One is, if we believe in public education, which I think we do, there has to be some distinction between, you know, you can call it exoteric and esoteric knowledge. You can call it the kind of information you make available to everybody in the internet and the kind of stuff we want to talk about as a community. Um, but you can also try to make an open community there. And the way that I think of it is that ideas can be taken in different ways. I use the term Darth Vader Marxist to talk about people that understand power dynamics like a Marxist and choose to take the side of power, right? They probably read a lot of Marx. I'm enough of a Marxist, I care what capitalists think, right? I read plenty of capitalists. And the same thing is true with MMT, but the way that I describe it is, like, we're doing the work. We're the community. I don't want to let fascists in. So I, I don't want to invite them to my things. I don't want to put them on panels. I don't want to have them having influence in our communities. And if there's any way that I can use any power and all of us can do that, we should. So I think it's one sense that MMT is a body of work. But there's another sense in which MMT is a living, breathing community of scholars. And that group, just like you can kick out sexual harassers from a conference, you can kick out people who don't share basic commitments from a conference. So I think it's important to acknowledge that the values that come into the ideas and shape the next question we ask, we could write 25 papers about how to build a military state. Have you written any? <laughs> I'm not going to be writing any in the rest of my life. Are you going to write one? If someone says, hey, I should want to write one, you can do everything we can to convince them not to. And if they insist on doing that, we can do everything we can to marginalize them. Now, I can't burn every book that they try to read. And I don't think that we should make this information, you know, like the Knights Templar, where you've got to get leveled up like uh, Robert Langdon in, in, you know, Da Vinci Code or something to get access to it. But I do think that as long as we're living and breathing and we can excise values in this community, we have a deep, deep moral responsibility to do so. Um, and, and that's why I think the MMT, we, we do have Green New Deal conferences, we go to them, but we actually have to build this, it's its own separate thing because there are conflicts of interest between individual issues and this issue and they align in some ways and they disalign in others. So I think it is important to have MMT in those spaces to meet them where they are, but it's also important to have our own space and build this thing on its own terms. Uh, and then lastly, real quickly on changing the myths. Um, this is what I was sort of saying earlier in my last talk, but I think you have to replace something with something. You know, crypto is a myth right now. The myth is this is the future of digital money. Money is sclerotic. Everybody knows it doesn't work as well as it could. So this is the way to do it. And if, yeah, but if you stand on the, you know, on, on, on top of history saying stop, that's not very attractive. If you can say yes and, right, if you can do the improv thing, but the yes and actually takes you in a lateral direction, 
but you've found enough common value with these people. I don't like the Fed. I was at a crypto conference the other day, usually as the resident crypto skeptic, like the pet one to hate, you know, on the, on the, uh, on the stage where they throw rotten fruit at. But everybody else on the, on the panel was trying to pigeonhole me as an authoritarian statist and said, oh, you just want another Fed, you know, su surveilling everything. And I said, I don't like the Fed. And that was the line that all the crypto media picked up on. It's like, oh, he's like us, but wait, he's not like us. But it bamboozled them a little bit and gave me enough common ground that they kept listening and didn't just dismiss me entirely. Not because I think they're going to save us, but because there is a sense, as John's saying, that these coalitions do shift, right? A lot of working class people are turning fascist right now because it's the only thing being offered. We're going to have to turn them back at some point if we don't want to... Yeah, and so I think replacing something with something better that finds the good values and doesn't tolerate the bad ones is, is the way. Okay. Thanks for the questions. I have very little to say, uh, but would be happy to talk outside of this more, you know, I just want to hear more people if that's okay. But my sense is like, you know, you can have a posture that's non-neutral, non-partisan. And um, y that might mean that there's room for market innovation and understanding certain stakeholder interests and things like that uh, with like responsible, you know, community orientation and regulatory integration, right? It's like there's, there's like room to feel out what that means. And, and the thing is that there's a lot of negotiation over what are those skills and resources that you might be able to leverage, right? And where is there potentially common ground, right? And where are those rules and lines for us? And maybe it's not a project we can do, right? But it seems right now that it allows us access to certain rooms. There might be shared values or certain skill sets. It seems to be happening anyway, right? And, and how do you, po you know, what position do you take in that? So that's been taking up a lot of my uh, thinking right now. And, and sometimes I find that I'm trying to think about who's the client, what's the revenue line, and what is the production being offered, and what are the claims being made on each other, right? What sort of exposure does that, you know, open you to? What sort of maneuverability does that close down or open, you know? Where do you feel comfortable? You know what I mean? And having people that have the resources to help you think through those sort of things and how decisions should be made in that context is so invaluable. And that's why everyone here is so important because you're the pure fundamental research that you know, these industries have to tap and learn from. You know? And it's like trying to open up that kind of conversation. That, that would be my uh, hope right now. You know, that's how I kind of broker that. Yeah. You know, something that Rowan was saying about inviting other people into the conversation. And let's have some fascists here. That would be interesting, wouldn't it? Um, and maybe let's not. Made me think, I, I spent six years as the director of the International Confederation of Associations for Pluralism and Economics. And our idea was to have an umbrella group for, you know, institutionalists, post-Keynesians, Marxists, whatever. Um, and, and, and Fred Lee was such a power. Uh, it, we, we lost more than one person w when he passed away. But he was on our board of directors. Uh, and um, I can remember the meetings where I, uh, and I was wrong. I would say, well, we have to include the neoclassicals or we're not being pluralist. And uh, if I may borrow your expression, the neoclassicals is basically what Fred said. Um, and in my own department, which had been you know, primarily heterodox, and we started to get the new uh, hires that were the neoclassical people, and they all said, oh yeah, no, we're all behind you know, this whole pluralistic idea. No, they're not. Um, and that's why I spent two years of hell, didn't I, Melanie, as department chair, uh, did the last two years to try to push back. Um, and so there are contexts in which it might be interesting to talk to them, but uh, I don't, you know, uh, there, there's, there, yeah, that's right. That's right. Not in our house. That's right. And then the cooperation versus the competition thing made me think of, um, I have a book on different schools of thought in economics and uh, in the feminist chapter, I talk about exactly that, 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 that our, our, our analogy or, or, you know, what we use is competition, competition, competition. And that, going back to what Fidel said, the, the, the two big blocks on, on um, these policies, the power structures 
in the economics discipline. And you know, you'll have feminist economists say the economics discipline is specifically masculinist in, in pressing for the idea that competition is the way things go. I, I got to thinking about that. I never thought about it before. Um, you know, in, in American football, actually most of it's cooperation. I mean, it's really complicated, but we focus on the competition, you know, how exciting this is, but the cooperation is really the hard part. Um, and, and, and I think you're right, that, that our mindset is that we are, you know, fighting with each other, and that's, but that's good, because that's the Darwinian thing that makes sure that the, you know, the, the free market wins out and so forth. Anyway, that's all I got. Thank you. Uh, I'll just say, I'll just say a quick thing about the Green New Deal and MMT. So uh, Martin Luther King, in the context of the civil rights movement, said, I have no time for the tranquilizing drug of gradualism and incrementalism, right? And when you think about all the major challenges, climate challenge and so on, similarly. So why, why MMT is critical to avoiding the gradualist incrementalist? Because you can get lots and lots of people all over the political spectrum who say, yeah, we agree, climate change is a serious problem, we need to do something about it, we need to decarbonize. I'm not talking about climate deniers, we're talking about serious people who understand this stuff. And then they say, well, yeah, how are we going to do this? It's too expensive. We can't afford it. Right? It's going to cause inflation. But what we can do is a small incremental step-by-step -step decarbonizing until we're all dead. So MMT completely changes that conversation, says, yes, you can decarbonize on a rapid schedule without bankrupting the country, without causing inflation, what are the real risks of inflation? So without the MMT framing, we're going to fall back into the, the standard uh, kind of centrist policy, policy approach. So uh, I'll leave it at that. Uh, Michael, if you could, there's, there's hands in the back, uh, Kennedy and David, and then I, I see all the other hands. We'll, we'll take three Sorry. on this side and then we'll go back to this side. Okay. Kennedy, all the way Okay. So I, w I was going to ask some question about energy commodities or something, but I, I was going to ask some follow question about energy commodities, but I'm more interested in confiding in the heart and pulling from y'all's. So I'm actually really curious, considering that, like, I focus on the discord space and I think what MMTers and people that are focused on this stuff really aren't prepared for is that there are a lot of debates out there that if you take this stuff seriously, and I've been in the rooms because TOS or mine allows you to like say things that you can't like on TV, but you're still getting paid in that revenue. So like I've been in the rooms where people will accept all of the tenets that we're hearing right now, but they're from their perspective, well, I want it for my Christian theocratic ethno state. So we have to be really prepared and like, I think from my perspective, like really codifying what our role is socially and I think taking some of Martin Luther King's approaches of nonviolence, we can sit in those rooms and respond to the fascist response, but we have to also, I think, think about like what it is socially, politically that we're trying to do because of the responses, because a lot of these gatekeepings that keep our country from using money in this way has been codified by conservatives for a long time. And I think that they're very prepared to for the response, but I'm curious about what you all think, especially like as some, you all come from MMT from different reasons, like how do you as, and I don't, I don't know your genders, but like as cis men all here, how is MMT and the research that you're doing, like figuring out how you're doing about power and like social relations in that way, how has it changed you emotionally and personally? Re regarding the the very first comment he was talking about how um how you talk about this given that um Louder. given that given that the um, the policy ideas are very progressive even though mmt purports uh, or we know that it is actually a neutral description uh what i want to do here is just in encourage everyone to find your uh rhetorical style because when you're out communicating this is really a a matter of rhetoric and communication. And um, I've been here two and a half days now, or almost three full days, and um, the rhetoric of the very smart, more Marxian influenced people I've met here is not gonna work in some of the places where I work. But my rhetoric is not gonna play work in some of the places where they work. And I just think that we all have a rhetorical strength for wherever we tend to be operating. And uh, my work where I'm operating, a certain rhetorical style 
helps, a certain rhetorical strategy. And I just encourage everyone to get better at whatever yours is. Figure out which one it is, get really good at it. Uh, I'm going to get even better at this one, having spent this week here, when I go back to work. And it, th that's it. My, it's just a comment for everyone to find your rhetorical style and get good at it. Um, yeah, just uh, first want to make uh, a quick comment, which is that um, I, I think uh, there's a saying like, with great power comes great responsibility. And it's such a privilege to be here with you know, all these brilliant people and to have access to this incredible brain trust that's been assembled. And, and so from that framing, I don't really think it, it makes sense to try to decouple the MMT as description and MMT as prescriptive. It's like, yeah, we, uh, we you know, have this a access to this knowledge about how it works. So what are we going to do about it? Um, so I, I think it's entirely appropriate. Um, my question, and Fidel, you kind of uh, uh, mentioned it towards the end, is is just uh, what is is there a formal antitrust stance within the the MMT uh, community, and how and how should we think about that? Especially because it seems like there's somewhat bipartisan momentum, uh, you know, behind general antitrust uh, uh, policies moving forward. So I uh, would love to hear more about that. Thanks. the chair of the committee that will deal with all the Twitch and Discord and all the new social media frontier, so. Uh, and I, I'll pass the antitrust comments to our legal team here. Okay. Uh, on the antitrust thing, short, easy answer. Nathan Tankers, Luke Heron, uh, Sanjuk Paul, Sandeep Vahisen. I'd start with those four. Uh, they're all very MMT conversant, if not MMT leaders themselves. They're all leading lights in the new antitrust movement. They're all very close to the FTC and DOJ and all that kind of stuff, and, and they're building the body of scholarship out. Uh, I won't assume that everybody else in the MMT community agrees with everything they say, but those when I put MMT and antitrust together, those are the names that come for me. Um, Secondly, in terms of how, how power has personally changed me emotionally, I mean, I was talking with Kay last night. I, I, I worked in an elementary school in, in Harlem in, in uh, New York for a year before I went to law school and, and seeing the level of poverty and the racial disparities up close and the broken families that were still being actively broken by the white guys from Wall Street downtown who funded the school in exchange for high stakes test accountability that entirely destroyed the school environment and forced teachers to get fired out. It broke any sense of gradualism. I mean, it broke any sense that there's anything other than uh, a complete victory we need to aim for here. And it also meant that if you really don't put those kinds of people who need things the most at the center of your worldview, they will always be ignored. They will always be downplayed. It's not an intellectual exercise. It's a matter of human solidarity. And at least in my view, you know, the point of, of learning things isn't just to understand the world, it's to change it. And we're always either changing it or not changing it with our actions or perpetuating what's already the case. So right now we do have serious problems. You know, we do have a problem with the eliteness of academia. We do have a problem with the white maleness of this community. And, you know, I came here with love and I had this problem. You can look at the first eight part MMT series I put on at Columbia and in part it's because of where the community was then and things like that but it was mostly white men and mostly mantles and we're on a mantle right now and there's been a few others in this conference and I came with love I didn't say I wouldn't participate even though that's normally my approach with mantles now but this should be the last time the Levy Institute ever has one sorry I'm just gonna say it never again it matters and if you can't find those people find different people have a conference that has different people so that we actually are building a community that isn't always just like this. Um, and then when it comes to things like having principles in general, I think part of the will to take power here is the will to be responsible. You know, great power comes great responsibility, but also if you actually want to win power, you have to be taking responsibility for problems that if you think they're not my problem, is a way of staying powerless. If somebody says, you need to fix this, and you say, I don't know how, okay, work it out. Because if you want to win, you've got to work it out. You can't just say, it's hard, therefore I'm not going to do it. We know how hard this game is. We know every other part of this is hard. Why is it it's so convenient that this one's just too hard? 
maybe that's actually a rationalization to not try something you're not really that committed to. And I want to just have a shout out to my colleague, Raul Carrillo, who was the year below me at law school at Columbia. He went to all the events I organized in the first year. He sat and listened to all those white male mannels and all that stuff. And he came to me afterwards and he said, you know, how can I help? How can I join? And we put on a second series and he said, you know, it can't be that again. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I know. And he's like, no, 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 it, it can't. And it took me a while to like click that I was still rationalizing away that as a priority. And it took me a while to click of how much I have to change my worldview to make sure I don't keep perpetuating those things. And I'm not saying that because I'm fully, you know, healed now. I got it. It's an ongoing process. But the best way to keep learning that process is to surround yourself by those voices who you're probably inclined not to want to listen to very much and to take them way more seriously than you might be inclined to on first blush because there are reasons in your brain telling you not to take them seriously that have nothing to do with how valid their points are and everything to do with the fact that you're in your position you are and they are the position they are. So I think lawyers often say everybody deserves a client. The next sentence in a good professional responsibility class is yes, but not they don't all deserve you. And you can choose with your labor and time who you affiliate with, who you identify with as the people and communities you're working for you're helping, you're trying to deal with. And let's try and make sure they look like the multiracial, multicultural, gender equal world that we actually claim to want. Because, you know, they say anarchism's, anarchism's living like you're already free. But when it comes to taking power, you have to take power like you're gonna govern the way you're gonna be on the other side of taking power. And that starts now and today. Um, I remember when I first started reading Rohan, it was like uh, him arguing with people on blogs. And it was uh, one of the first things, yeah. It was awesome, yeah. Uh, on antitrust, I like Frank Pascale and also Ramsey Woodcock. Ramsey Woodcock's awesome. Um, and, and, and not read enough, you know, so uh, check him out. Uh, I, I think like another aspect of what Rohan was getting at is that it has to go global in our perspective. Like there's a, at least in the law, a lean towards a very domestic orientation. And the US experience is like, you know, heavily wrapped up in extraction and all sorts of compromise sort of stuff, right? So you can't really talk about like the US worker, right? Without thinking about a lot of other workers. And that means like development studies and international political economy and working with policy in other countries where you're not only like providing resources, but also like being of service and listening and incorporating that, you know, and that's like a tricky thing to start, you know, to like continue that like decolonization tradition and, um, and, and show why that's so practical to do. And another thing is like, you know, like we could start practicing listening strategies. So at the Institute for Global Law and Policy, uh, we go out to different countries and all we do is we actually practice how we talk to each other. Like how do you present your entire project in four sentences? How do you mirror that back? How do you unpack those in two minutes? You know, like these sort of, how do you change how you talk to a funder versus if you're talking on the news? Right? And just like learning how to listen to each other, of cultivating that sort of sensibility, that can be real helpful. Um, you know what I mean? Like uh, that sort of work. And, and uh, yeah, so uh, just to Kennedy, I just wonder, like for example, it'd be interesting to know where you think like there's mistakes or blind spots right now. Like what would be a cool thing to do, uh, you know, with your like media expertise and thinking about you know, the sort of issues you kind of intimated in your statements. I wonder what you had in mind. for those websites allows you to say a lot more and be more free in the way that you prescribe your ideas. But that means the toxicity that you get back, as long as people aren't using slurs, you have to be really prepared for that. And I don't, 
I've seen a lot of leftists, you know, on the communist and uh, neoliberal side, like get in these debates, and I've not seen the MMTers yet. And I think there's a lot more, I think, social power arguments that we have to sort of talk about. And because it feels like I sort of have to make those up on the fly uh, because I just read the research, um, but there's not really a, and Derek Hamilton has been sort of helpful with that. Um, but it, there's not a lot of like social responses to the fact that, I mean, you can respond to MMT critiques by saying, I'm gonna use resources to make sure that I'm gonna codify abortion in this way and then we're gonna use it for this reason. Like there's no reason for a right wing response to be okay with that if they're allowed to get public support behind it. And then how do we combat that? Like that that's a ideological moral thing, but it's using, you know, our economic principles to say the government can do this. And like that's sort of the thing that I'm prepared to have to work around. I was uh, struck by the comment of figuring out what your rhetorical strength is and going with that in trying to spread the word because I think that's absolutely right. Um, I look around at all my friends and colleagues who do different things with you know podcasts and so forth and and uh, gosh I should do no I'm not any good at that I, I can't I can put the cowboy hat on and, and do that and, and mess around with that but there's other stuff I just can't do so I'm not going to try it and furthermore your audience is going to determine what rhetoric I'm really good with rich white men. Uh, in convincing them of MMT. You know, you're talking about diversity. Okay, well, I, I can't help the fact that I'm a white male, but I can leverage it, and I can use this against the people that, that are, are, are our biggest problem. I've never had a problem explaining it to basically a crowd of rich white Texans. Uh, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Now, do they walk out and then later kind of doubt it? Well, yeah, but you have to plant these seeds and you have to hit over and over and you have to, what is that expect? The earworm and that, that, that sit there and think about it. But I think that's absolutely right. You, and find out what you're good at and, and focus on that. And um, uh, I guess buy a cowboy hat is part of the whole thing as well. All right. So there were questions in the center there on this side and then we'll, we still have time. So we'll, we'll gather three questions uh, starting with All right. Um, thank you very much. I'm Charles, um, all the way from Nigeria, and um, listening to the conversations and also, you know, going back to the global south. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. You know, I listen to the conversations. You know, in terms of what ha you know, the applicability of all of the ideas. For instance, um, the talk about the CBDC. And then, of course, purist monetary policy interventions for the North. And looking at the global South now, you know, we have situations where, you know, countries of the global South are not just dealing with issues of inflation and exchange rent, you know, difficulties, but they're also looking at, you know, economic issues like poverty, like unemployment, and so monetary authorities are not just going to be looking at pursuing exchange rates you know, or inflation. They also have to be very much involved with developmental interventions. Because, I mean, as socially responsible institutions, they have to do that. And then they have to do that in response to what the fiscal authorities are doing. And so there's this constant tension between the monetary authorities and also the fiscal authorities. You know, so how do we bring all of these perspectives? Because, I mean, if you look at a CBDC, for instance, you know, some countries in the global south may be involved in it, but the question that comes to my mind is, is it the right timing? Or is it a response to inability to understand the regulatory requirements for cryptocurrency and, you know, just following the trend, looking at the economic realities? So how do we bring these to the global south to be able to domesticate it, to respond to their own economic realities. Thank you. Uh, I had a pretty short question. Um, I heard you say uh, we should tax and regulate market power out of existence. I think uh, regulate kind of that makes sense to me, I, like antitrust law and that kind of thing. Uh, maybe there's something else um, if you want to go into that. 
I'm curious what taxing market power out of existence looks like, whether it's just sort of general tax on wealth or something like that, or if you're thinking about like more targeted tax policy. Thanks. Um, going off of sort of Rowan, your proposals for different policy ideas, um, I'm curious like what kind of infrastructure is needed to sort of support in similar initiatives um, and sort of any more detail you can give on like what the creative strategic process is in terms of coordination among it sounds like members and NGOs or outside orgs um, and scholars. Thanks. I'll just start uh, quickly with the first question, and then uh, Rowan will, will probably say more uh, about uh, central bank digital currency in the context of the Global South. Uh, the simple statement is just to borrow a phrase that uh, Ndongo mentioned yesterday on the panel. We're really talking about development by asphyxiation, as he said, right? So are we just you know, introducing a central bank digital currency and thinking that this is the thing that will change everything else? Or are we actually implementing strategic economic policy uh, you know, on the ground that will actually transform and get us out of those structural traps uh, facilitated by new payment system, you know, mobile payment technology and, and so on. So the belief that the technology itself will solve all of our problem is, is unfortunately a, a reality in the, in the policy space out there where central bankers think that if you just make this new technological leap in the payment system, everything else will be, will be fixed, which is, which is a, a, a problem. Um, and the question about uh, taxing, you know, abusive market power out of existence. Uh, this is really the, the, the MMT idea about decoupling the, the spending from the taxing. The, the mainstream understanding is that you need to tax something to generate revenues to pay for your progressive agenda or for the war or whatever it is. So here, the purpose of taxation is to decarbonize the system. The purpose of taxation is to reduce inequality. The purpose of taxation is to reduce speculation. The purpose of taxation is to end the possibility of oligarchies, right? So in terms of how do you fine tune it with specific taxes, we can get into the details, but I'm talking about taxing that abusive market power out of existence and transitioning away from a system where we think about redistribution of wealth and resources to a, a system where we think about pre-distribution of wealth and resources. So we don't have to tax the oligarchs because we don't want to create oligarchs in the first place, right? So it's changing the engine of the economy so that it produces the right results to begin with. It doesn't produce pollution, socioeconomic exclusion, you know, oligarchs and, and so on. So uh, working on the details in terms of how you do it, it could be wealth tax, it could be tax on speculation, tax on transactions. We, we can work through the, the, the details. So. Um, yeah, thanks. First of all, uh, in terms of CBDC in the Global South, my first ever MMT paper that I got an opportunity to write with a research grant from IGLP, the Institute for Global Law and Policy, uh, was on mobile money in developing countries because I was trying to find that intersection of what's changing, what's different, where's the cutting edge, and how does it fit with international development issues. That was in 2013. And now, you know, it's CBDCs, it's eCash, etc. But rather than starting with this crypto idea where you've got a solution in search of a problem, there's two things. You can look at what's happening and see where the trend line is and try to move it. Or you can look at a problem, see what would need to be solved and try to bring it into existence. So for me, giving everyone a bank account is great. I support it. Postal banking, public banking, Fed accounts, support them all, worked on them all. But a lot of people don't trust bank accounts. And right now we're in a world where the surveillance privacy balance is way tipped. And if you give everyone a bank account and don't do anything else, that means more control for the central bank. That means more censorship and, and, and ability to have your livelihood shut off by someone else. And so when I look at that, the e-cash idea, the idea of something that works like cash, you don't ask permission, it can't be shut off, it's anonymous, becomes the solution to having a positive vision there, but also baking in the right values. And making sure that people know that's even an option and trying to support that is, is a pretty big part of it without becoming techno-utopian. Because if you don't have the politics, if you don't have the community, it doesn't matter how good the technology is, it's gonna get perverted or distorted. 
Um, in terms of bringing in institutional expertise, I think this is where, you know, having that public education aspect of MMT, right, it's descriptive in the sense we're just pushing some stuff out there that you should be able to read on your own and get something, but then also doing the cultivation of networks and support, outreach, finding allies, finding comrades, finding people there who match the people where you are and connecting them so that there's back channels. When something new happens here, we talk to others. Like there are people here in the UK, there are people here in other networks that I've spent time with and recent times you get busy, you don't spend enough time checking in. And that's a shame, you gotta do better about that because without that glue, in those high stakes moments, you're not sure who to trust, you're not sure who to turn to. And um, you know, in addition to IGLP, which John mentioned, I just wanna give a shout out to Fadel and Ndongo's group who put together one of the most amazing conferences I've ever been to uh, before I then dropped the ball and contributed to a book chapter afterwards. Um, but that was on monetary sovereignty in Africa and it was an entirely different group of people. It was an entirely different group of scholars. There was enough MMT is there that it had that flavor but it was an expansionary bridge building, coalition building effort. And it looked entirely different to any other MMT conference I've ever been to. And it was fantastic. And so are there people out there? Hell yeah. Are they doing good work? Hell yeah. Would they be doing even better work with MMT? Hell yeah. Would we be doing better work if we spent a little time listening to them and knowing who they are and knowing their names? Definitely. So I think that's a big part of it. And then in terms of the infrastructure support initiatives, um, first of all, Part of this is about finding the right wave. It's like surfing. I've never, you know, I'm a surfer. I'm Australian, but not a surfer. And you're out there and you get waves come, waves come, and then you get that big wave. Oh, this is it. This is the one. And that big wave could be the right pot package issue. It could be the right catalyst event or something. But if you can pick those right issues uh, and, and then you can deliver something to the staffers, the legislators, Maybe it'll pass into law, maybe it won't, maybe it'll live to fight another day and the language will be lifted into real law or whatever else. But if you can find those issues, then you can build trust with the people on the other side. They know you're adding value to them. Then you come to them with the next idea and they're, they're interested in it. So that's part of it. And you know, probably some of you know this, but for those who don't, at least in the US Congress, the dirty secret is that all the important work gets done by staffers in their 20s and early 30s. And if they trust you, then they do the work on making the office trust you, and they do the work on actually making the bill get passed. Um, so thinking about relationships means not only looking at the most powerful person, but looking at all the people underneath doing the real work and making those people understand that we're on the same team and we're here to help them. Don't come with your hand out, come with a gift, right? And then, um, just to give an example, uh, the, the successes you work on one thing can build unexpected coalitions. Rashida Tlaib worked on the stablecoin regulation bill, the Stable Act I mentioned. Um, but because she was on the same House Financial Services Committee as Stephen Lynch, who wanted to have something on stablecoins, she reached out and asked him to be part of that. He said, yes, they've never worked on anything together before at all. The next time we had to work on something, he was opened the door and willing to talk. And then we had an individual relationship with his office that led to the e-cash bill. And that kind of relationship hopping and going, not, not leaving people behind, but hopping to build is so important. I hate to be that person that says networking, but I set up a nonprofit called the Modern Money Network for that reason. And um, when it comes to internal network development, we have to be really conscious about actually building the army, building the pipeline. The Progressive pa Talent Pipeline run by uh, David Siegel and others uh, puts I think 150, 200 staffers in, in training sessions every year. They had Stephanie Raul and I on the first panel on the first day last year. That's because Siegel trusts us and we trust him and then he puts us in front of those people and then they trust us. And that there's more work to be done, there's more power to build there, but I think that's the kind of pathway to having a, a pretty large network, having staffers who know that we're all on the same page. And a big shout out to three names here. One is Chastity Murphy, who was Rashida Tlaib's economic advisor. She's now a senior person at Treasury, queer black woman. Claudia Machon uh, uh, Pagon from uh, AOC's office, who's now at the SEC, uh, Hispanic woman, and Aya Ibrahim, who was in um, uh, Ayanna Presley's office and is now in the White House working on crypto. These are three women of color working at the cutting edge of fintech who went from the Congress into the highest levels uh, of the administration and the bureaucracy and we help them every day and they help us and they're the kind of people that we're trying to empower in those rooms and they're doing the amazing work as a result. So if we didn't have them, none of the stuff I wrote up there on the board would have happened. Um, so that's the kind of 
conspiratorial, we're going to nudge once we, we were on the same team here kind of thing that I think allows us to get beyond kind of worrying how you're just going to persuade someone fresh of each new idea. You don't have to persuade them when they already trust you because you're already on the same team. And then last little thing there is when it comes to NGOs and things like that, first of all, you need the journalists to tell the story properly. So you need to have relationships with the media, as we said two days ago with the media panel. Um, but you also need to have an idea of which of the NGOs are there, whose personalities are in the way, which NGOs have real weight, which community organizations actually have members, which ones don't, whether that's good, bad, the different effects which means a lot of network mapping, a lot of institutional mapping, a lot of knowing who's where, where their background is, where their sticking points are and why. And then knowing where you can push them and press on buttons and why. So it's a people business at the end of the day as much as it is an ideas business. Yeah, man. <laughs> um, I also, just picking up on what Rohan said, you know, the personal is political, the political is personal. So what does that mean? It means like getting real concrete about how we reproduce our own communities right here. So if we're not like, you know, like getting our PhD students through and in jobs and making sure that that, you know, next generation workforce represents the sort of parties we would like to go to, which are like diverse and you know, unexpected and have lots of different types of people, right, truly democratic and represent all walks of life, then we're failing, right? So that's like a big part. So for example, uh, Luisa Scarcella, right, who runs INET, the Young Scholars Initiative, uh, the Finance Law Economic Working Group, they're awesome. And she runs a multi-jurisdiction team, primarily of women that look at digital assets and uh, taxation, do a lot of policy work. Uh, you'd be very invited to get involved uh, in their sort of events. You can write her directly or through the organization. There's the Institute for Global Law and Policy that runs an annual event. They pay for you to come out. You know, it's pretty cool. It taps you into a big network. Um, we run a summer school with the European Association of Evolutionary Political Economists, uh, Appeal and INET it, at the University of Rome. Uh, it's going to be in July. That'd be great if you apply. Uh, there's some funding. Uh, every other year we're going to try to host it. You know what I mean? Like we have lots of stuff. We're going to be in Naples in September with the EISA. You know, it'd be wonderful to have you come down on law and political economy. And the goal is to help you with your career, right? And, and you know, there's a lot of like a real deliberate thought about representation and what it means to be part of a community. And there's no substitute for face-to-face, -face, right? So if we're not like helping the people to our left and our right, you know, What's the point of what we're doing? Um, the last thing I'd say is it's also just really exciting. Oh, you should check out, by the way, Rohan's not talking about his stuff, but you should check out his talk on the Manchester International uh, Law Center on how it would integrate with the international thing. It's so good. Yeah. Um, uh, last thing I'd say is that, you know, like when we're advising with governments right now, there's this, and it's happening around like the tech stuff. It, it opens up all the development state questions right now. They're like, you know, what sort of taxation should there be for infrastructure? What kind of infrastructure? You know, education and skills, you know, all those sort of things. Who will be the people who will be in those positions, you know? Do you have a working relationship with them where you could help lean in to make sure it's a certain community, you know? All those sort of like tricky informal things. And that's again where we really need all your help to help us think through those sort of like you know, tough questions. Yeah. Um, I know that there are burning questions, so we will only gather the burning questions in less than 15 seconds if you can. But comments, let's save them for the coffee breaks and, and lunches. So can I see the burning question hands? Yeah, thank you. Um, my question is, when we talk about MMT, we talk about unleashing the government's full potential and just pulling the lever and letting the cash flow. But my qu uh, the point where I've, I'm still struggling with is that 
uh, in the last 40 years, we haven't seen that a decoupling of economic activity from resource use and extraction is actually occurring or possible. And then when we talk about greening the environment and through the insights that we gain from MMT, uh, I feel like there's a contradiction there because, of course, we need to decarbonize our economy, but just stepping on the paddle is, doesn't also seem very uh, long-term oriented for me. Uh, my question's for Rowan. Um, you in, uh, early on in, in your talk, uh, I, I, you mentioned uh, the deficiency of the legal definition of a bank deposit, and I was wondering if you could just elaborate on that definition and how that how the deficiency <laughs> of that definition is leveraged by the crypto community. question about energy, fossil fuels, and, and growth. Uh, I think it's, uh, we have to completely change the metric of what we consider growth. I mean, there's lots of MMT and degrowth literature that's growing as we speak. I'll be on a panel uh, called MMT and degrowth uh, in, uh, with the International Ecological Society in the next couple of days. I, I need an office space upstairs, Dimitri, please, for, for the session. But essentially, the metric that we use for growth is GDP. So every time we have an oil spill to clean up, GDP goes up, it gets celebrated, yay, 3% GDP growth, right? Every time we have cancer treatment because people are drinking polluted water and eating polluted food and we say economic growth, but we're not looking at the hidden costs. So changing the metric, meaning looking at a dashboard of alternative economic indicators and quality of life indicators, including genuine progress indicator and other things, and once we use those alternative metrics as our kind of focus, then we can think of growth in a different way. Growth of quality of life, so the quality rather than the quantity as measured by, by GDP. And I think if we do everything we descri I described earlier, global reparations and all that transfer of technology, we're going to have a lot of growth because we're going to have to rebuild global infrastructure, a lot of growth in the traditional GDP sense of the term, but it will be qualitatively different. And then after 20, 30, 40 years, once we reach a, a new kind of steady state on a new sustainable and resilient economy, who cares about growth if there's better quality of life? So the technology is available. It's not going to take us all the way in. We don't even know what we're going to do with the poisonous stuff and solar panels in 30 years because we haven't invested enough thinking and research and development and material science research, but we must, right? We have plenty of space to go on the green space, but we need way more resources and research and development to truly reach that uh, ultimate uh, goal. So, uh, Rowan. I'll be quick. Um, on the deposit issue, essentially, it defines a deposit as that which is issued by a bank, and then defines a bank as that which issues deposits. So if you don't issue a deposit, you can't be a bank, and if you're not a bank, then you're not issuing deposits, so it mustn't be a deposit that you're issuing, which means that money transmittal balances, etc. aren't. The book to read on this is Morgan Ricks' The Money Problem, and him and Lev Menon have written about this, amongst others. Uh, on the question of letting the cash flow from MMT and sort of decoupling from resource extraction, I think, you know, that... I agree that the logic of GDP growth is the logic of the cancer cell um, above all, uh, but I don't think we have to take GDP growth slowing down and, and real resource growth slowing down as equivalencies. And, and even if they're a strong heuristic today, I don't think we have to assume that relationship has to be fixed. I like to joke uh, about a, uh, an economy built around you know singing jokes and massages, all of which have an extremely low uh, quality uh, resource extraction cost, but also, at least in my opinion, all pretty fun. Um, so having that kind of our, uh, economy that we move towards, it could still have quite strong GDP growth, um, but wouldn't actually be uh, very resource intensive. And similarly, there's all these people who like to say that people should stop going to college and it's a waste of time, etc. But I think growing into better, more mature people, if we have the time and capacity as a society to let people not be fully formed until they're 22, 25, we're moving this way in terms of criminal law. We're saying adolescence is a, a new legal category that goes from 18 to 28. And we shouldn't assume that people are culpable for everything for the rest of their life that they did there. And we, we're establishing the age of 28 as the age of brain maturity. 
security. So that's at least to me a decent starting point to say we all get to keep growing and working out what we're going to contribute to the world until then before we're asked to be part of the workforce. So a dramatic you know, slowdown in the workforce and time to grow is, I think, another low carbon intensive way that we could increase people's standard of living. And so this goes to the other question is, what do you do in moments when you can't just shut everything down? Now, first of all, I think we do need to shut a lot of stuff down. With a job guarantee, with a Green New Deal investment, we will be building other things back up. And that, you know, there will be a shuffle. There will be changes in power. But you know, a lot of people have got jobs right now, like oil company CEOs. They've been fully employed for a long time. Let's give them a little bit more job insecurity and give some other people some job security. Um, and I come from a country where a few thousand coal miners in a few districts shut down the entire political debate every year. And we can, again, value their interests, but maybe not at the expense of the other 22 million people in my country. Um, but and one example about this is, I think, illustrative. In the UK, there was rationing in World War II and nutrition went up. We think of rationing as terrible. It was the first time kids got a healthy meal uh, in, in, in many parts of the country. And when we think about good rationing, an obvious example to me today is digital culture, where you can copy paste the same thing. And the only thing standing in the way is dumb copyright laws backed by a theory of economic incentives that's fundamentally neoclassical. And so if you said in the middle of COVID, yeah, look, you know, some, some prices are going to go up, but also we're going to suspend all your Netflix, Hulu <laughs> account costs, and we're going to take it out of the profit market margins of those bastards and you know we'll start from there and that might have really improved people's quality of life even as other things go down but what we saw was quality of life goes down and nothing goes up so we can be creative in how we offset inflation not to make the single increase in used car prices go down but to make other things that we enjoy that are currently massively overpriced due to rent seeking and excessive profits and reduce those so that people on net feel a good standard of living or feel like there's some at least offsetting. Um, yeah, that's all. Thanks. Well, you can go ahead and drop the mic. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is the end of the session, yeah. end of day three. Thank you so much.